There goes God. The words were enthusiastically declared by an onlooker who in 1965 in Selma, Alabama, saw Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel marching in the front ranks of the civil rights movement with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Horace Westwood, then the minister of this congregation, was there speaking to the members of First Unitarian Universalist afterwards. He recalled his experiences of being part of a group of ministers, nuns, rabbis, young people who stood nose to nose with the troopers, the city's police, the sheriff's posse, 15 deep, and helped to usher in the Voting Rights Act. It's been a long time, a long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. Westwood believed that a change was gonna come and that it would be a revolution. He thought that anyone who had a good heart, who wanted to see it through, might be called on in the words that he quoted to the congregation of Paul's letter to the Romans to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. He knew something of which he spoke. His friend and colleague, the Unitarian Universalist minister James Reeb, was murdered in Selma. So were the Unitarian Universalist laywoman Philo Luizzo and the civil rights activist and Baptist deacon Jimmy Lee Jackson. Jackson's death provided some of the inspiration for the marches in Selma. Westwood praised them for the genuineness of their ecumenity and power to bring together priests, Episcopalians, Methodists, Presbyterians, a Unitarian minister from Hawaii, and a rabbi from Montreal. There goes God. Many of them, regardless of religious orientation, were inspired by the man who King called my rabbi and others named Father Abraham. Abraham Joshua Heschel blended a profound sense of piety, a belief that religious practice was about unlocking the enormous store of not knowing, of being puzzled, of wonder, of radical amazement found within each human soul with the heat of prophetic fire. Religion is about bringing us closer to God, he taught. For him, this meant an embrace of that perspective so dear to both Judaism and classical Unitarianism, the belief that we humans are created in the likeness of God. To imitate God, to act as God acts in mercy and love is the way of enhancing our likeness. The words are Heschel's, but they could have come from the 19th century Unitarian theologian, William Ch Ellery Channing, Channing, after all, preached that the great work of religion is to unfold the divine likeness within us. Heschel argued that Judaism stands and falls with the idea of absolute relevance of human deeds. Amashio Deo, the imitation of God, is in deeds. The deed is the source of holiness. Again, whether atheist or theist, neo-pagan or Buddhist, the Unitarian Universalist would say much the same thing. Deeds, not creeds, our position is occasionally rendered. In Selma, Heschel famously condensed such sentiments into a single statement. I felt like my legs were praying. I felt like my legs were praying. Have you ever had that kind of experience where time breaks open and the work, the moment, the space you inhabit, the thing you're doing feels holy, feels like a prayer? At such moments, the 
finite disappears into the infinite and the significance of the individual's action takes on a universal hue. Many human beings are serving as one in a sacred cause. Again, Heschel reflects on his time in the civil rights movement. It is a de declaration of the mystical heart that can be found in the pursuit of justice. A mystic is one the great theologian Howard Thurman taught us who finds something within their own experience that opens them up to the infinite. In our sermon series, Lives of the Spirit, we are considering some of the great spiritual activists of the 20th century. Diverse in their philosophies and theologies, they were people who, like Heschel, each found in their own particular way a sense of the mystic, a connection to the infinite within the quotidian work of justice making. Some, like Heschel, named the infinite the divine. Others, such as the Detroit-based activist Grace Lee Boggs, called it the experience of a leap in faith of what it means to be human. A leap in faith of what it means to be human. There goes God. You might recall that our sermon series is animated by the questions, what does it mean to lead a good life? What are the resources that will allow me to lead such a life? How will I know that I am leading one? Fully aware of the crises of his hour, Heschel eloquently shared these questions in a different way. The most important problem with uh, which a human being must face daily is how to answer the questions. How is one to maintain one's integrity in a world where power, success, and money are valued above all else? How to remain clean amidst the mud of falsehood and malice that soil our society? You might phrase our questions otherwise. For my part, it is difficult to deny that the human good is constantly in danger of being sucked into the mud of falsehood and malice. Almost 60 years ago, Horace Westwood could preach in this pulpit, America is awakened, suffering is not in vain. Heschel could write of his time in Selma, time, Selma was a day of sanctification. And Sam Cooke could sing. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. But today in Galveston County, right here in Texas, there are efforts to destroy what remains of the Voting Rights Act. In a federal trial, the county Republicans are seeking to eliminate the sole precinct with a black and brown majority and return the commissioner's court to all white rule. If the plaintiffs have their way, the case will make its way to the Robert Supreme Court. There they hope that the court's majority will continue its penchant for assaulting women's rights, attacking LGBT communities, and undermining the gains, or shall we say, prayers of the civil rights movements with and deal a serious blow to democracy. Hate crimes everywhere, especially in Texas, are on the rise. Just this past week saw the symbols of hate and terror deployed in our own neighborhood. Someone hung black plastic bodies from third ward trees. Meanwhile, in the last four months, two Unitarian Universalist congregations in Texas have been targeted, one experiencing arson, the other an armed incursion. In the last two months throughout the country, almost 50 synagogues have had to be evacuated because of bomb threats. The mud of falsehood and malice 
The question remains, how shall I lead a good life? How shall you lead one? This month, we turn to Heschel, not because he answered such questions in easy times. He sought them during hard ones. More than anything, he believed that to be blessed with free will, the ability to choose was something that God had created humans with. Offering his interpretation of Moses' encounter with the divine on Mount Sinai, he imagined God telling the prophet, I have put before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life. Choose life. Now, for Heschel, this was not a misogynistic slogan. It was a reflection of his belief that we each contain an image of the divine. God has a stake in the life of every human. Religion's task is to cultivate distrust for violence, sensitivity to other people's suffering, the love of peace, he wrote. Any religion that did otherwise was, in his mind, a false religion. He came to that belief through his understanding of the holy. God was a pathos, a personality that, yes, had gifted humans with free will, but over and over and over again tried to call us to pick love over hate. It is through acts of mercy and love that we can experience a communion with the divine consciousness and enhance our likeness to God. There goes God. The words were offered up as Heschel strode by the crowds in Selma, perhaps because he looked something of the way that people occasionally imagine a part. A rabbi from the Hasidic tradition, his long white hair and flowing beard resembled those found on the Sistine Chapel. He deeply believed in the prophetic tradition. His profound prayer life and constant religious practice led him to a sense of fellowship with the feelings of God. It caused him to do what he could to convey the word of God. Andrew Young, one of Martin Luther King's closest companions, described Heschel as one of the prophets. His words today have lost little of their power to trouble the powers and principalities of the world. Listen to what he offered in 1966 on the anniversary of the death of President Kennedy. It made no impact on our laws and customs, he protested. No lesson was learned, no conclusion was drawn. Guns are still available, cash on demand. Mass killing in Chicago, in Houston, Texas, in Arizona, is becoming a favorite pastime. Guns are still available. A biographical sketch of this man, Abraham Joshua Hessel, could so name the mud of falsehood and malice which beset the country 50 years ago and continues to beset us today is something we briefly turn to. He was born in 1907 in Warsaw, Poland. At the time, Warsaw was one of the capitals of the Jewish world. Perhaps as much of, uh, as a third of the city was Jewish. His family was Hasidic. The Hasidim are a branch of Judaism easily recognizable for their distinctive dress. The men have black hats, wear black clothing, have beards, earlocks. The women practice a form of sartorial modesty. The tradition is devoted to the belief that the divine is everywhere. It's present in even the most mundane and banal acts of life. Religious practice is the search for connection to this sense of the divine throughout all that we humans do. The sentiment is caught in Heschel's early poem, God Follows Me Everywhere. God Follows Me Everywhere spins 
a net of glances round me, shines upon my sightless back like a sun. God follows me everywhere. For Heschel, the experience of seeking, searching, questing after God came almost as soon as he was conscious of life. Named after his great-grandfather, Rabbi Abraham Yahshua Heschel, one of the most significant rabbis of the 18th century, he was a child prodigy. Even before his bar mitzvah at 13, he was called upon to offer interpretations of the Torah, Judaism's sacred collection of texts. He was ordained into the rabbinate at the tender age of 16. Shortly thereafter, he left Warsaw for the University of Berlin to pursue his doctorate. His dissertation was on the Hebrew prophets and later formed the basis of his most famous text, which we read from earlier, the, the Prophets. In it, he sought to understand those biblical figures who had experienced the overwhelming impact of the divine and found within not a call away from the world, but a call towards the world and a call to make justice. His time in Germany coincided with the rise of Nazism. Amid this atmosphere of rising anti-Semitism, he found himself caught with the question, how to be holy? He taught and wrote in Germany until 1938 when he was arrested by the Gestapo and deported back to Poland. After 10 months there, he received an invitation to join the faculty of the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, and he left Poland a scant six weeks before the Nazi invasion. Most of his immediate family perished. Afterwards, when asked to describe himself, he would say, I am a brand plucked from the fire in which my people was burned to death. I am a brand plucked from the fire. The horror that animated his theology. Since Auschwitz, I have only one rule. Is what I say, or would, would it be acceptable for those who were burned there, he wrote. Princeton professor Julian Zelizer has summarized Heschel's quest to answer this question as a need for a spiritual religion to help rid the world of evil and ensure that such depravity did not happen again. He pursued it over his remaining days. They took him from Cincinnati to New York where he served on the faculty of the Jewish Theological Seminary wrote numerous books and came, became convinced that his answers were to be found through the civil rights and anti-war movements. I felt like my legs were praying. There goes God. The mud of falsehood and malice. Heschel synthesized tradition and cultural creativity devoted to the essence of Hasidic mysticism. I go with my reveries as with a secret in a long corridor through the world. And sometimes I glimpse high above the faceless face of God. He reinterpreted it for the world in which he lived. The religious community he had known had turned to smoke and ash, did not try to reconstruct it in Cincinnati or New York. He reimagined it. He and his wife, Sylvia, a concert pianist, had one daughter, Susanna Heschel. Perhaps because he was a father, he broke with the gender norms of the Hasidic. He and Sylvia held a bat mitzvah for Susanna and encouraged her to pursue a life of Jewish scholarship. Today, she's one of the most important Jewish theologians. She's convinced that if her father had lived past 1972, he would have come to be understood as an advocate for feminist theology. For her part, Susanna has been responsible for one of the most significant additions to the Passover Haggadah, the teaching about the Passover holiday in the last hundred years. This is the placement of the orange on the Seder plate. 
The symbolism of this is sometimes misinterpreted with a story that circulates about the orange resulting from some man telling Susanna that a woman belongs on the bima as much as an orange belongs on the seder plate. But this is not the orange's origin. Instead, she shares what the, the orange was originally meant as a symbol of solidarity with the queer communities. She writes, an orange is the fruitfulness for all Jews when lesbians and gays are contributing and active members of Jewish life. In addition, each orange segment had a few seeds in it that had to be spit out a gesture of spitting out, repudiating the homophobia of Judaism. God follows me everywhere. My lips always amazed are truly numb, dumb. Like a child who blunders upon an ancient holy place. My lips always amazed. Abraham Joshua Hessel's poem, God Follows Me Everywhere, offers a sketch of the fullness of his thought. We are called to live a life of radical amazement. And experiencing life as amazing, we are challenged to see how prophetic visions are scattered in the streets. Let justice well up like waters. Righteousness like an unfailing stream, said Amos. And in that day, the mountains shall drip with wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the watercourses shall flow with water. A spring shall issue from the house of the Lord, preached Joel. The wise will consider these words. The prudent will take note of them, for the paths of the Lord are smooth. The righteous can walk on them, proclaimed Hosea. A long time coming, and a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. How might we understand, engage with, draw from this prophet, this mystic, this spiritual activist in our own quest to answer the question of the good life? For my part, I find two notes sounding in my life song. In these days, the mud of falsehood and malice may, might seem particularly deep. It might be hard to believe that there's truth in Sam Cooke's words. We might, like my friend Tony Pinn, believe that the myth of Sisyphus is more appropriate for our era than the Hebrew prophets. But there's still something to be gained from Heschel's wisdom. Sisyphus, you might remember, was cursed to forever roll a stone up a hill. Each time he brought it to the top, it would slide back down. He was doomed to repeat his task eternally. The philosopher Albert Camus imagined Sisyphus strangely satisfied with his unending task. Tony interprets the story as something like the quest for justice, writing, Things are not well. The threat has not been tamed, but we persist. We should work to make life better, and in so doing, imagine ourselves happy, like Sisyphus. The quest for justice might be, as Tony argues, never ending, never complete, never truly to be experienced in a moment when the mountains forever drip with wine or the hills flow with milk. But but there are two notes from Heschel which I hear that can help us on our way. Radical amazement and the prophetic. My lips, always amazed, are truly numb, dumb. I sometimes speak of this in terms of the resurrection of the living. Heschel taught, and I believe, that the purpose of religion is to help us wake up to the world as it is. Beauty is everywhere. It can be found in almost every moment. Each breath is precious. Life is filled with blessings. It is amazing to be alive. 
This is a teaching we shall hear echoed again and again and again in the lives of the spiritual activists we encounter in the next months. Within each of their own experiences, they caught something of the infinite and became aware of the universal that dwells within all of us. Find it now for a moment. Your breath connects you to all being. Breathe in the air of the world. Take it in. Let it circulate. Let it become you. Breathe out your own breath into the world. Your very spirit and mine, for breathing is nothing less than life's spirit, is intrinsically ever connected to all that is. See how prophetic visions are scattered in the streets. This sense of wonder, this experience of waking up to the world as it is, this thing I name the resurrection of the living and Heschel spoke of as being always amazed, can lead us to seek to build a better world for all. Deep calls to deep. The beauty of the world calls us to create more beauty. In his time, this experience of what Heschel named as being stunned by that which is and cannot be put into words, led him to speak out against racism and white supremacy, to speak in favor of peace, to speak in opposition to violence, and to call for an end to poverty. In this small sermon, we can only brush a little upon the life of so profound a man. What does it mean to lead a good life? For Heschel, the answer was to be inspired by awe and beauty and cry out against the politics of cruelty. He would have it that awe and beauty inspired us to do the same in this hour. God follows me in the tramways, in cafes, Oh, it is only with the backs of the pupils of one's eyes that one can see how secrets ripen, how visions come to be, says Heschel. Let us close then with a prayer. O oh, Spirit of life, which Heschel named God, and which we might call by other names, breath flowing between human and human plant and animal, sacred circulatory system of being, stir within us today, and each day, something of the power of awe and wonder that life draws us to. Awe and wonder at human beauty, awe and wonder at the majesty of trees, awe and wonder at the blue of water, awe and wonder in the cafes, on the streets, in the long corridor of the world. Awe and wonder everywhere. And in this sense of awe and wonder, may we each be inspired to greater compassion and empathy, a greater desire in Heschel's words to acts in love and mercy, so that we may enact the vision of the better world my feet were praying, and as a service of praise to the glory of creation, choose justice, choose righteousness, choose to be part of an upswelling of hope, joy, peace, and let us say it again, love. There goes God. May we grow ever in the spirit of the divine, however we might know it, through deeds of mercy and love. And that it might be so, I invite the congregation to say, Amen.